Yorana Korua. Uh, my name is Sergio Matau Rapu. I am a documentary filmmaker from Rapa Nui, uh, and I'm one of the filmmakers behind Eating Up Easter. Uh, a, a snippet of the film that you just saw. The full length version is uh, actually available uh, if, if you folks are interested in it. Um, but I'm super, super honored today to be uh, actually moderating this panel uh, with some wonderful human beings here. Um, I am, um, today I'm calling from uh, the remote location of Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's where my home is. Uh, it is also the ancestral lands of the Dakota and Ojibwe people. Um, I want to encourage everybody that's uh, watching via OV today to be part of this conversation. Uh, this is not just about us, the four blocks on the screen, but it's about you. We want to hear about your comments, uh, your questions, um, your frustrations, if you have those. Uh, use that little chat box that you have right there and uh, digitally, magically, they'll come to us. Um, uh, there, I want to let everybody know that there's also a survey at the very end of this panel um, to kind of get insight from you folks about uh, what you learned about or what you uh, took away from this discussion. Um, so uh, first off, to warm up all your typing fingers, I'd love for uh, the audience to just type in your name, uh, where you're calling from, and who are the ancestral people that call your home home? Uh, and if, if you don't know, um, uh, you can Google it. There's also a link that we can provide for you to find out. Um, and uh, I'll start off by uh, introducing our wonderful panel here uh, that's joined us. They are all uh, thought leaders, uh, provocateurs, um, uh, people who have worked in Hawaii uh, and are hoping uh, for a better future. Um, we'll start off with uh, Kalani. Kalani Ka'ana Ana is the Director of Hawaiian Cultural Affairs and Natural Resources uh, at the Hawaiian Tourism Authority. His role includes providing Hawaiian cultural expertise and implementation of programs which relate to Hawaii's cultural initiatives for the visitors industry. Um, also, identifying ways to provide assistance regarding the perpetuation and presentation of Hawaii's host culture, its language and values, and assures that all activities and guided and guides, um, I'm sorry, all activities are guided, conducted, and evaluating, evaluated with a high sense of cultural awareness towards both the Hawaiian culture and, uh, and Hawaii's multi-ethnic communities. Connie, thanks for being here. That's a huge uh, bio, so we definitely want to dig in to really find out what uh, HTA is all about. Um, Lorian Lala Nas is also with us today. Um, recently, she joined the city and county of Honolulu's um, Office of Climate Change, Sustainability, and Resiliency as the Climate Resilience and Equity Manager. We'll also love to dig into that and, and find out more about that. Lala is dedicated to recultivating community resiliency and well being through the practice of regenerative relationships. She has spent the last 10 years repurposing her global travel industry background in service to uh, generational transformation and adaptation. In 2016, Lala founded Conscious Concepts, a social enterprise in service to Aina, and uh, arts initiatives providing project management, community programming, and place-based travel curation. Thanks, Lala, for being here. Uh, and finally, Mahina. Mahina Paishan Duarte is the co-founder and managing partner of Vai Vai Collective, a contemporary Hawaiian space for community culture and commerce. Mahina is a social entrepreneur who has worked in a number of educational and cultural organizations. Most notably, she's the founding executive director of Pai Pai Oheia, uh, served as a policy program manager with NOAA's uh, Papa Hanaumokuakea Papa Hanaumokua Marine National Monument, and held the position of head school teacher at Halau Kumana in Kanu Oka'aina Public Charter Schools. So Mahina, thanks for being here too. Um, Tourist, tourist, tourism, we're gonna to talk a lot about uh, it, it, this type of economy, this, this industry. It's something that you know, affects Rapa Nui, where I'm from. It's, it's something that, that affects Hawaii. Um, in fact, so many of, of these island communities in the Pacific and the Atlantic depend on tourism. 
not only that, folks on the mainland, like, you know, uh, have to deal with it too, um, profit and also suffer from it. Um, so I'd love to first really just kind of start um, at, at the base level, you know, really get a sense from all you guys about what is your relationship with tourism, whether it has been through at a young age, um, you experiencing it or in the current work that you do, how, how do you interact with, with tourism and, and tourists? Um, it, Mahina, can we start with you? Sure, um, thank you to you, Mata'u for hosting us and to all those who helped to coordinate uh, this event. I guess what I wanted to share is that, you know, I, in, in some ways, I'm a product of tourism because my father and my grandmother and my grandfather were employed uh, by, by different uh, companies uh, that, who's, who was very dependent on, on tourism dollars. And so I grew up listening to a lot of stories where my grandfather and my grandmother would kind of talk about these golden years. That's how they, they'd like to talk about it and how they conveyed their relationship with tourism. It was like the 60s and the 70s, um, late 50s even, prior to um, Hawaii becoming a part of, uh, or becoming a state, the 50th state. Um, they talked very nostalgically about how uh, this time, these golden years where they would just, it was more about Ho'okipa, this value of accepting others and wanting to share your, you know, wanting to be generous with your time, with, uh, with a meal, with experience. Um, so I got to hang out because my, gra my grandmother was the hostess at the Moana Surf Rider for 15 plus years. I spent most of my middle school years I mean, I, you know, obviously as a middle schooler, I didn't have a lot of money, but I would save my $2. So I would, you know, on the weekends, I would um, find my way, go on the bus, whatever, and, and go visit my grandmother. And what she would do is like, tell me to go, go on, with the uncles on the catamaran on Waikiki Beach, go with the uncles, the Waikiki Beach boys, and, and go learn about surfing, go learn about uh, canoe surfing. And so you know, I think what they tried to do is they tried to share their their uh, their way of ho'okipa. Um, that you know, their their sense of ho'okipa was really about telling, sharing with folks uh, the generosity of aloha. Now, um, on the flip side, my father had a different experience. He rose up the ranks, uh, worked his way up. Um, and, and eventually became one of the, the managers at, of a hotel chain I won't mention. He's no longer there, but he left really frustrated. He was there for just under 25 years and he left out of frustration because he felt he experienced extreme racism. Like basically be, he felt like he would never um, assume higher levels of leadership and management because even though he, he basically um, capped out and that was his frustration and I remember not he he would work 16 17 hours a day every day I grew up knowing my father only on our drives to school and I I got from him this real sense of of pain um, pain because he didn't feel this is what I got and this is what I make up that he wasn't accepted that the color of his skin um, made him out to be less than. And so what I share is that, you know, I, I, I experience emotionally the, the extremes of tourism from, from this, you know, twilight and, you know, twilight twinkle in your eyes, lovingly adoring tourism. Um, and at the other side, feeling the frustration of my father because he felt, um, he felt wronged. Thank you. Mata, you might want to put on your um, your mic. Thank you. I'm usually on the other end, like the, the answering the part, not the questioning part. So technical difficulties of my fingers. Sorry about that. But uh, the, Lala, can you um, talk to us a little bit? You've had a, a long history in tourism before you're in your current position. 
Um, what, is, what is your relationship with like in, uh, with tourism now? Aloha. Um, thank you for this this vessel, this platform to be able to share and talk sorry about this. Um, similar to Mahina, um, tourism actually is part of, of why I'm here, you could say. Uh, my parents worked for Pan American Airlines and that's how they met. And so um, I was literally traveling, flying around the world in my mama's tummy on airplanes. And was really privileged to grow up in that space, especially during the Pan Am era, which was still what I would say in the history of our contemporary mass tourism is, was that romanticized um, space of traveling to a place and seeing people and seeing culture and seeing Aina and going there because it was different and wanting to really learn about it. And so I grew up with that type of culture as being a traveler. Um, and being welcome to places. Um, so growing up, um, after I graduated from Manoa, I actually, I wasn't planning on joining the travel industry, um, but did. And that was uh, when Norwegian Cruise Line came to Hawaii um, almost 15 years ago, I was coming back. And so I was one of the large group of locals that were hired, um, got our merchant mariners license and were stationed in the Caribbean and all through uh, West Indies in Central America and Canada and brought the ship home and did uh, worked on the cruise line industry and then joined the hotel industry on the east coast of the continent um, with Marriott, um, which is a world renowned, you know, Fortune 500, now the largest, um, re, you know, accommodations, uh, corporations in the world um, and worked my way up the corporate ladder um, and got to got to really benefit and learn and grow as a professional, as a young woman in a global industry. And it was incredibly beneficial um, in so many ways. Um, and I came home 10 years ago, interestingly enough, um, during the last economic crisis um, and uh, came home with a different set of eyes and uh, saw something I hadn't seen before I left. And that was kind of my generation stepping into their leadership roles and doing it in a different way. Um, and I eventually got back into tourism um, in Waikiki and was more and more coming to the realization now that I'm home and really wanting to reconnect to the values that raised me that the industry that I was brought up in was actually not aligned with the value system of the people in place that I came from and was actually becoming detrimental in a lot of ways. And throughout my, my corporate culture, my corporate um, tourism profession, I'd always been in sustainability initiatives where that was getting hotels, you know, Energy Star certified and looking at uh, labor union issues on the cruise line industry. And, and even in the private jet company when I worked here in Honolulu was really looking at, you know, all our menu items, how can we source locally and the little things that we can do to be sustainable. Um, and I realized after a while that um, I it was time for me to do other things. So that was kind of, uh, and shifted actually later on with conscious concepts and all the, all the ideas I had in wanting to help hotels shift uh, to a more sustainable way of experiences in the visitor industry. Um, realized I, I, I couldn't do that to the level that I wanted to do it within the industry at the time. And so I decided to jump off the cliff and started my own social enterprise, which was really geared towards place-based travel programming that was um, in relationship with the people in place that were being visited. Um, and so I had done that with Conscious Concepts for five years um, before I stepped into this new role within um, the Office of Climate Change, Sustainability and Resiliency. And so... Um, yeah, that's been my relationship thus far with tourism. It's kind of born and raised in it. Mahalo. Wow, that's a that's also a very different, interesting like way of experiencing, you know, that that industry. Um, Kalani, I um, I my understanding is you worked in in tourism before getting into then H your current position in HTA. Can you tell us a little bit about you know that maybe that past life and and why you decided to transition? Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, it's interesting. Actually, it's the reverse. So 
Um, I would say my relationship to tourism was it was always around me, but I was never a part of it. Um, much of my upbringing was in Kailua, where my family has been for generations. And so Kailua has been a hotbed for tourism on Oahu for a long, long time. And so I was always surrounded by it and impacted by it, but wasn't really necessarily a part of it. Um, and then in 2016, life took me on a different path. And I got a cold call from a headhunter um, that was like, hey, I think you'd be great for this position. Do you want to apply? And I was like, tourism, what is that? Hawaii Tourism Authority, what do they do? Um, and I kind of just dove in. Um, and I interviewed for the position and I was hired for the position I'm in now. So um, my relationship to tourism grew more intimate, I think, in the last four years, um, being at the Hawaii Tourism Authority and in the role that I am around Hawaiian culture and natural resources and seeing what we can do to, again, transform and innovate. Um, because I think the, the nature of mass tourism as it's been developed um, is at a time where it needs to transition again. Um, and so that's sort of the short story for that. Thanks. Awesome, thank you. You know, I, I often wonder, I mean, I, um, so I'm, I'm from Rapa Nui. I also spent uh, living a while in uh, Hawaii on Oahu and I still have some family on Oahu. Um, but living in Hawaii, like my family didn't work in tourism, like my friends didn't work in tourism. It's hard to have that tangible connection if you're not putting a lay onto a tourist or, or driving them to their hotel. You know, I'm, my, my question is, why should, like, why should uh, uh, a young man or young woman bagging groceries in Kahuku care about if we have tourists landing in Hawaii or not? How can somebody try and draw the picture of how that person is affected by, um, by whether the tourism economy, how strong the, the tourism economy is? Um, this is a pop-up question to anybody who has the answer. <laughs> I mean, I can maybe start at a macro level. Um, so in 2019, Hawaii um, had 10.19 million visitors who spent roughly 17 billion um, in total expenditures. Um, that meant 225,000 people in Hawaii on any given day was our average daily visitor census. And so it's sort of hard to ignore uh, the economic impacts at that level. Um, and then I would sort of argue um, it's the interconnectedness of industries, right? And so, although that person may be bagging groceries in Kahuku, um, it's not completely unrelated from maybe somebody staying in illegal um, transient vacation rentals down the road in Kahuku or, you know, different things like that. So maybe we'll just start with that. Awesome. Do you, do you, um, Mahina, as a, as a business owner uh, now, like how, how do you interact with uh, with tourists or tourism? How, how are you impacted by that? Sure. Actually, as a small business owner, we, we don't interact uh, too much with, we don't interact directly um, with, with visitors, except for kind of the business traveler. Um, so for those who are coming to Hawaii for conferences and conventions, we definitely have had interaction there. Um, we do have, we do interact with, uh, businesses that retailers, operators, um, that also, that, that do benefit from, from tourism. What I'd like to say though, is as a Hawaiian person, um, you know, how do we benefit? I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if benefit, I, my question to myself, I guess, is what is our responsibility to the traveler as a Hawaiian person? And so, um, we call the way that we are taught is that any person that comes comes um, to visit your place, your home, we have been taught to to welcome them warmly and generously and, and, and with kindness first. And we also say Ho'okahi no la o kamalihini, which is you're only a visitor for one day. And after that, uh, we, we have this expectation of the visitor after a full day of, you know, of, of giving and, and making you feel comfortable, sharing a meal, sharing conversation. There is an expectation that you will join in in, in the work or in the daily living. Um, and so that, that for me, that, that's how I, how I look at it. We have a responsibility to these travelers and they too have a responsibility to us as as 
um, its hosts. Lala, as a business owner also, but also your position uh, with the city and county, um, can you can you speak to that that interaction with with customers? Why why should the non you know person not working technically in tourism industry care about this industry? It's a really good question, and uh, I would say if we're if I'm coming from the space of looking at um, as a resident, the affordability of this place, right? We have to understand, and a lot of the work we do in the Office of Climate Change is really looking at systems thinking and knowing that one thing is connected to another. It's all interconnected, right? And I think we're coming more and more as a collective consciousness understanding that, and that's becoming more and more a solid fact. But the, the reality that our tourism industry, um, and if we learn about kind of the story history or the cosmology of it is that it's directly related to real estate and it directly affects um, and markets Hawaii as a place not just to visit but also to come and live right a beautiful um, retirement or second home paradise who wouldn't want to come here right? um, and that directly affects the cost of our housing as well as our utilities and our food costs so if we're looking at economics it directly affects the local person um, and especially those that are working class. Um, and you know, the most recent um, numbers coming out of some major reports um, since COVID, for example, is that you know, pre-COVID about 40% of our population was living paycheck to paycheck or below. Yeah. Um, and now that we're in the midst of COVID, there's projections that by the end of the year, 60% of our population will be living paycheck to paycheck or below that. And so the heavy relationship with tourism that our economy has um, relied on um, is impacting the stability as well as the well-being and the livability of a place. So it is, whether you're in the industry or not, by default living here, you are affected by it. Um, and so that's what I would say as far as how could a local person be in relationship with tourism and see what the interaction or the impacts are. Yeah. Yeah. And therefore also the ability to um, participate in what could be different, yeah. Yeah, well, and the, let's, let's talk about how it could be different or, or what is different about it. The, the title of this um, has two, uh, the, the title of this panel has really two interesting uh, phrases, restorative economy and regenerative tourism. Lala, could you kind of define those for us? What does that mean? Yeah, this is, um, this is a, the stuff that gets my blood going. Um, I've been working in this space kind of quietly for, for quite a long time. And I think it's just part of my DNA and my kuleana um, to this place to um, be part of, of the transformation that I think more and more of us are seeing is possible and is already happening. But to give you like a, an official definition of what this funky, cool word, regenerative tourism or re regenerative travel is, um, kind of the textbook definition is, um, it defines success as more net benefit after costs have been accounted for, all waste eliminated and all damage restored and more personal and institutional capacity to adapt, be resilient, creative, collaborative, while providing a greater and richer sense of meaning to the local community and its guests. So that's, you know, now that we can start, how can we start putting names, um, naming, nourishing, and illuminating what we want to see in the future? What, what, what was good about our industry or the visitor industry that we want to take with us and what was problematic that we know we can change and this isn't you know this this type of work has been going on for a good 20 30 years now actually with um thought leaders um what's her name sandy pollock is is one that i've been i've been mentored by so to speak and many local um practitioners and experts that have been talking about face-based indigenous visitor industry or sectors um for a long time and so this this isn't something necessarily that we need to figure out how to invent um 
I want to reaffirm that everything we need is right here. And that revaluing of self um, and place, I think, is where the industry um, can really uh, step into its next ability with. Um, you know, Mahina and me talked about this a couple years ago when I was learning and processing with her a bit around transforming travel. And she, you know, I said, you know, what kind of visitor do we want here? You know, like, let's name what kind of visitor we want. Like, we want them to be responsible and respectful and, you know, tread lightly and, um, you know, be, be able to come here and know the basic maybe words or want to learn or want to give back to and work, you know, shoulder to shoulder with each other. And Mahina is like, you know, before we ask the question of what kind of visitor we want, let's ask ourselves, what kind of company? Ma'aina do we want to be or we should be and that's kind of part of the regenerative tourism model as well it talks about it gives the capacity and ability for the local the, the Kama'aina to actually be in a space of um, wellness and well-being and be able to steward its place to be able to receive visitors in a, in a reciprocal way so that's a little yep. bit yeah, so in a, in a way, I mean, that you're you're talking about um, a complete, maybe a different mind shift uh, uh, for the the community in Hawaii uh, as everybody being responsible in this in this uh, relationship with with the tourists. Kind of Mahina, a little bit how you were talking about too. Um, Mahina, I did want to ask you about you know we we have a, a lot of folks from the mainland on here too. So if you could. Talk a little bit about the Aloha Aina movement. What does that mean? What uh, you know? What does that come about? And how can you define to somebody um, Aloha Aina who who has maybe never been to Hawaii before? I'll take a, a stab at that. That's a long conversation. However, um, one of the quotes that I really loved uh, from the film is this: "When this place dies, um, nobody, no money." will be able to bring it back. I'm gonna say that again. So um, when this place dies, meaning Rapa Nui, nobody, no amount of money will be able to bring it back. That, that, that's, a, that's an attribute, that's a, a feeling of aloha aina. Mm -hmm. That I am, my, aina is, is, is my ancestor. Aina is me, I am aina. I'm looking out and I see the ocean of Kailua Kona. I, I connect. I, I know how to connect genealogically to that ocean, to that tea leaf plant that's on the other corner of my eye and to the hapu'u over there. So it's this idea that I am part of a continuum. I'm only one little speck of, of, of being um, and I have 2,000 years of, of being that comes before me. And if I do my small part well in a responsible, in a, in a, in a thoughtful and an intentional way, that I too can add um, to the mana, to the spiritual power that will enable 2,000 more years. So it's this deep knowing, it's, it's a deep, it's a depth of knowing that one, you belong, two, that we are we are all connected, and three, that I have a responsibility. That to me, in essence, is, is aloha aina. Um, and so for me, can I just share a little bit what just like um, one thing, so two things, one, specifically, yes, I think there's somebody in the comment that, that had said, what about caps? Should we, what, what do we think about caps? I definitely don't, I personally, do, do not, I'm not advocating for let's 2021, let's have a, you know, 10 million more visitors. Can we think of, can we come up with a more sustainable threshold? And how do we do that? And what are the metrics to do that? And why should we do that? Because there's, we know that there's a cost to our infrastructure. We know that there's a cost to our coral reefs. We know that there's a cost to our, our waste systems, therefore our water systems. And if we know that there's a cost in all of these other environmental, um, you know, to the ecosystem, and if we believe that we are connected to Aina, 
then, then if our aina suffers, then we suffer. And one last thing, what I do not like, and there's, I think, another comment, um, you know, the difference between oh, traveler. We'll get to the comment. We'll get to okay, the comments okay. and questions I'm too. You don't, you don't have to worry about that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And but, there's just one. Oh, one this is good. This fine. Um, one other comment um, is like, uh, what's the difference between traveler and, and tourist? So I'm just going to say what, for me, what boils my blood is arrogance. So to me, what separates a traveler from a tourist, and this might not be the, you know, the technical definition, but from my own, my own definition, a tourist is a, is a person who comes, who, who comes with a lot of arrogance, who expects like, I gave you my, my, my dollar. I expect, I expect the world from you. And I'm, I'm not, I'm, you are here to serve me because I gave you my dollar. And I'm not, I, I don't, I think that's that kind of attitude. Um, that kind of attitude is exactly the attitude has, that has brought us to this place where, you know, we have atrocious murders that are taking place in a place that you live in Minneapolis, that we are still standing for Amona and all of the other indigenous issues that, that are, that we still address uh, today. I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> no, perfect. Keep, uh, hold on to that soapbox because we'll come back to it. Um, but I, but I did, uh, Kalani, I did want to give you a chance too. I know, and be, Mahina, if, if uh, this question is more for both of you, I'm not quite sure, but uh, Aloha Aina, Aloha Aina uh, declaration, is that right? Uh, Aloha Aina futures. Can somebody define that for me? What is that movement? Because it sounds like to me, um, it's taking this, this idea, this understanding of Aloha Aina and implementing it into maybe a, a, a business, uh, some, some type of economic infrastructure. Um, can, can either of you define what, what the declaration is? Sure. Um, I'll take a stab at it and then Mahina, you can jump in too. Um, I think for us, the Aina Aloha Economic Futures uh, was us sort of organically organizing and, and talking with one another about the future we wanted to see. We recognized that COVID presented us with a fundamental opportunity to transform and innovate um, and to create systemic change. And so uh, we found the 14 of the co-authors, we found ourselves on a Zoom one night and, you know, us being who we are, we couldn't help but make more work for ourselves. Um, and so we created this declaration that outlined four principles. And really, I think we're trying to give people tools by which to educate themselves and then really to see the world as we see it. Um, it's an inclusive platform. I, I think I wanna make that fundamentally clear that it just so happens that we're Hawaiians and native Hawaiians who created this. But fundamentally, if you call this place home, and even if you don't call this place home, but you love it like we do, you're a part of this. You have a kuleana and you have a responsibility to ensuring that we don't get to a place where we're asking ourselves, and I think many of us already are, of if you know this gets to a place where it dies, no money and no money could bring this back. And, and I think we're trying to stave that off. And so I know how economic futures .com is a way you can check it out and go learn about it. Um, I think one of the big things for me that happened recently is the Hawaii Tourism Authority Board of Directors unanimously adopted the declaration a couple of weeks ago. And I think that that's a fundamental shift in the way we at Hawaii Tourism Authority are thinking about our role. Because for the better part of two decades, HTA um, really was focused on the branding of the Hawaiian Islands and trying to build travel demand. And certainly that's still gonna be a part of our, our mission moving forward but it has to be a part of a holistic system that looks at destination management as a whole. And so I think um, when you think about Aina Aloha or Aloha Aina as a principle, um, we have to ensure that we're doing that uh, in everything we do. So our branding has to be aligned with that. We have to be telling creative and unique stories and we have to be mindful of who is telling those stories and what stories we're telling. And that's the branding piece of it. But then we have to make concrete reinvestments into infrastructure, natural resources, the indigenous culture of this place and our community as a whole. And so when we understand that we need to reinvest in the product, as it were, um, then we can thrive. And so I think that's really the fundamental shift from a destination marketing organization to a destination management organization 
is really the future of where we need to be headed. So, can can either of you or any of you give an example of what is a type of a shift that maybe like a, like a normal business, you know, if they adopt Aloha um, Aloha Aina, this Aloha Aina declaration, what is an example of a, a shift in product and policy and something that they would normally do? Thank you. So, um, what I want to encourage all of our our um, audience members to do is check out Aina Aloha Economic Features. Um, and that's on ainalohafeatures.com. And look, we're, we, this is a, step, a four step process and we are now in, the, in step three. So as a business owner, as a nonprofit person, as a community mobilizer, as an in, individual resident, this is what we can all do. So um, what we can do is that we have an assessment, self-assessment tool, basically. So we have these principles that are helping to guide all of us as individuals, as again, you know, corporations to so small business owners um, to, to help us make uh, good decisions, ethical decisions, decisions that are guided by the principles that we, we are sharing. And so what I encourage you to do, if you have, if you're part of a nonprofit, if you're part of a community group, if you're part, if you have a business, um, please take a look and what you can do, it's a very interactive tool. And then assess yourself. Assess yourself based on um, based on the Aina Aloha economic uh, values and principles that we have created. And what that's going to do is it's it's intended for you to contemplate. Well, if I am scoring, you know, poorly in a particular area, then you can guess what? You get to do something. You get to take agency and do something about it. And we have a pretty robust uh, resource list. And the idea is that this is an ongoing open conversation and no one person has the answer, but collectively we can, we can step into leadership and we can create the future that we all want to create for Hawaii, for our beloved Hawaii um, and be a resource to one another. I think if I could just add, you know, I think um, Kamehameha Schools is another signatory, another major landowner in Hawaii who is committed to these principles as well. And so, you know, I, I'm, I probably, if you would have asked me four years ago, if tourism was ready for the kind of shift we're talking about today, I would have said, what? No, absolutely not. Um, but in that time, for whatever reason, um, things are aligning and people are being awakened uh, to a new level of consciousness um, to make the shift because that level of consciousness that created the problems we have today will never fix itself. And so I think education really has to be the fundamental part of this. So we have to do better at educating visitors. You know, Uncle Nainoa Thompson uh, got an award from the visitor industry last year. And he was like, you know, why am I getting this, you know, tourism award? I'm, I'm not in tourism. And so he accepts the award very graciously. And in his oratory, he, re he really sort of changed my thinking about this. He said, Kalani, Hawaii is the classroom. And we have 10 million visitors who come to the classroom every year. What are you going to do with that opportunity? Um, and I think that that's the beauty of tourism is that we forget its intrinsic value to bring people together and to forge relationships. And so kind of tying back to the golden age of tourism, people were building relationships, right? Guests, you know, knew the manager of the hotel and the hotel manager knew that Susan was here for her anniversary with her husband and would maybe drop a dessert for them. Um, and it was a reciprocal relationship. Whole Kipa is not a one-way road and neither is it a transactional one that's just based on money. And I think we need to get back to that. Um, and then when we do that, we educate people and hopefully we uh, in a way get to export that. We get to export that learning. We get to export that importance of relationships, Kanaka to Kanaka and also Kanaka to Aina, wherever you're from. Um, because it's not unique to Hawaii. Um, it's for all of us. Lala, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I just truly enjoy being able to have this, this intentional conversation with these two amazing, beloved human beings. Um, and it just, this is part of the co-creating and the co-expression and practice of our evolution of our futures, right? And, what I'm really excited about being Keikyo Ka'aina, being a child of the travel industry and then a professional in it, to, to Kalani's point, 
the past three or four, maybe five years within the visitor industry. And it's reflective of, I think, our world and global um, framing and shifting that's happening is some major um, opportunities and shifts within that sector in many different levels. And I think, you know, when we're talking about the big bad tourism industry, you know, we don't want to pigeonhole necessarily saying black or white, tourism is bad. Um, what we want to understand is like, well, what system is it is operating in, right? What is this operational system? So what we're really looking at is a global neo-capitalistic extractive economic system, right? And basically our tourism industry is mimicking that and has mimicked that and was kind of founded in that 130, 20, seven years ago, you could say, if we want to take it specific to Hawaii. And actually um, the industry as we know it now, you could say about 70, 80, 90 years is kind of the, the beginning nodes of what we're experiencing today. And, you know, I always say like, I want to go back and look at source when I'm trying to learn and understand something. So what was tourism here pre-contact, right? And to be able to see and learn stories of how King Kalakaua in his era, mid-18, late 1800s, was marketing Hawaii to the world. And it was a place for healing and wellness. That's what Hawaii was marketed as to the world. And it had the, the Hawaiian culture and people had access and agency over that industry. And if we look at our industry today, it's, it's definitely not that to the level that um, it was or that it should be if we really are marketing Hawaii through its culture, right? Um, and I think going back to like, what can we do or what's happening is like seeing HTA adapt, um, adopt the Aina Aloha Futures, seeing the strategic plan for HTA um, from 2020 to 2025, really focusing and shifting um, and acknowledging the fact that the current form of, of industry is unhealthy and kind of creating these new clear visions and pillars of natural resources, Hawaiian culture, community and branding and the destination management. And I think that's the first time in the history of the tourism industry here in its current form that we're actually gonna make strides to have management of this industry. We really never have, we've never had a tourism, you know, ministry of tourism. HTA was always a place where um, there was, it managed money and giving out and the exchange of that and a lot of marketing and telling the story as Kalani was saying. Um, and, and to say, you know, to honor HTA's role in the support systems through grants, um, millions of dollars a year to natural resource and wine culture entities. I think we need to also remind ourselves of that um, relationship in a way that there has been restorative or regenerative relationships in certain ways. Um, I think looking at, going back to Mahina's point of, uh, you know, 10 million too much and someone commenting on that and be like, mm -hmm. no, now is the time to figure out what is our carrying capacity as an island and as an island earth. With the climate change initiatives going on, we're realizing the science is saying we have finite resources, right? And because we have that, we're really imbalancing not just our local ecosystems, but a global one. Um, and really looking at how are we shifting our measurements of GDP to examples of expanding to GPI, genuine progress indicators versus gross national product. Like that's what I think the modern contemporary sciences within climate change, as well as what indigenous and traditional um, science and knowledge is continually emerging and coming more and more at the forefront with is this understanding of needing to diversify and expand what we're looking at and what we're measuring from this very linear model of economics to you know whether we're looking at circular economy or quadruple bottom lines. If we're not measuring that, we're missing out and we're continuing on this very imbalanced form of even solutions. Um, and our office um, actually has been working on this and I'm excited. Um, I want to leave a little bit more space to talk. Yeah. Um, allow my peeps to talk more too, but. Yeah, of course. <laughs> no, this is, this is really great. I mean, like you bring up an interesting point of like how we, how success is measured, right? How you measure success in tourism. Kalani, can you talk a little bit about 
how are there metrics that are used at HTA to measure a successful tourism industry and what those are? Sure. So I think for a long time, we spent a lot of time on arrivals. We spent a lot of time on rev par or revenue per available room per person per day spend and total expenditures. And so what we've done, uh, the board in January took action to adopt the strategic plan. And in it, we've actually recrafted those key, met uh, key uh, we call them key performance indicators, KPIs. Um, and there are four now. And the first one is resident sentiment. And so we've measured resident sentiment uh, for the past 30 years. And so that's gonna be a key performance indicator. How do residents feel about tourism? Do they feel it brings more benefits than problems? And so that's the first one. Uh, the second is the visitor experience and their visitor satisfaction. And so again, we've always tried to understand our clientele and what they thought value, what they, what they thought was valuable um, from that experience. And so we'll continue to measure that. And then the next was per person per day spend and total expenditures. And so um, by taking the four key metrics and essentially balancing them now, what do residents think about it versus how much economic benefit we get from it, I think is really a, a place where we're starting to turn the corner. Awesome. The, you know, kind of coming back to Mahina and, and uh, there's been a lot of questions in the chat. Thanks, everybody. Keep come, uh, sending them in. I'll get to them. Um, and, you know, one of them, at least a couple of them have addressed um, this concern around a traveler versus a tourist, right? As, as we've kind of defined this in this conversation, um, a, a, a traveler seeks uh, engagement. Um, a, a traveler is somebody who wants to grow, who wants to connect with the community, with the culture, um, whether it's through food, language, arts, all of that, where in comparison, a uh, tourist um, is just there for, on vacation. Give me a beach, give me a Mai Tai, it doesn't matter where I am, I could be in Florida or in Hawaii. Um, and we, you know, unsurprisingly, we see the same relationship play out in Rapa Nui. We have tourists, we have travelers, and they're all from different um, economic uh, spheres, and they're staying in a variety of different places. Um, culturally, obviously, for our communities, it's more beneficial to have the traveler, to have the engaged individual. Um, but I wonder, and I, you know, I'll, I'll present it to whoever wants to talk about this. How do you, how do you cater to that type of person? And, and more so when it comes to the values of Aloha Aina, how do you instill that or motivate somebody not from this community who hasn't grown up in the way that, that you guys have, but to have that sense of, of respect um, to, to the place and the people? Uh, what's, what's the process of, of getting to that? Okay, I'll go first. Oh, oh. Yeah, go ahead, Kalani. Either one. Go ahead, Kalani. So I think first and foremost, you know, from our perspective, um, it's important to understand the state has an office for this, right? The Hawaii Tourism Authority is a state agency. And I think that's, that's another fundamental shift. I have to be the voice for our residents in these conversations. Because at the end of the day, we're the only ones there to be their voice as stakeholders, right? Because if not, Marriott's got its board and they're going to advocate for their stakeholders and the economic benefits for their companies. And we have to do a better job for advocating for residents, right? So that's one shift. The second piece of this is we've got to leverage technology, right? There's so many opportunities to reach the right audience today, whether it's through social media marketing or more targeted marketing. There's so much data. Um, that we can leverage to reach the right person, right? And so how do we get Pono travelers who have good intention? And then the second piece of that is um, we've really got to do a better job of setting better expectations, right? I always use Singapore as an example. We would know everybody in this video and who's watching knows what you don't do in Singapore, right? And so it's like true gum and litter, right? They're known for it. We've got to do something similar, right? We've got to say that Hawaii is a beautiful place to visit. It's got a warm hearted people, but no, you have to come respectfully and you know, you have to bring a gift and you know, like local style, right? You show up to somebody's house, you take something with you, you don't show up empty handed. And maybe in this case, a traveler comes with good intention. Maybe at that first blush, that's the first thing that they bring with them is an open heart and an open umeke, right? From which to fill up with good knowledge and good energy and good mana. And so really, how do we tell that story ahead of time? pre-arrival 
Um, and then of course, post arrival, working with travel operators, tour operators, local people, right? To sort of fill in the back end. So. And I just want to be clear, you're not advocating for like corporal punishment if, if they break the, the rules, Correct. right? Yeah, okay, all right. Just, just want to be clear. Mahina, how do we get more Pono travelers? How do, how do we get more people that are respectful in Hawaii? Um, I'm actually going to respond with a question, <laughs> if you don't mind. So my, my, my response is recognizing that tourism still makes up our, our primary uh, driver of GDP here in Hawaii. What if we ask ourselves, if not tourism, then what? So if we want to, if we want to diversify our economy, how do we do that? And what is that future state going to look like? Um, and even in a, in a, in a, in a more diversified economy, I think there, I mean, this question still is valid, you know, um, I, I'm an advocate for telling our own story. So are you, I think all of us are, we got to own our narrative and, and to the extent that we within our capacities and, and those who are listening on, like I, I would hope that more dollars are allocated to independent storytellers and, and media experts, because I think there, it would be beautiful if we had a network of, uh, of storytellers. I think we do that well. It's intrinsic to who we are as Hawaii people, Hawaiians and part of our local culture. And I think more money and attention has to be diverted there. And I think it, if we were to do that, then it would kind of force us hopefully, I'm not sure if this is HTA's role or somebody else's role or a collection, a collective, like, so how, it, how do we, how do we brand ourselves? How do we, how do we want to uh, market and brand ourselves? And it's, it's not from this sense, like, it's, please don't hear me wrong. Like, it's not my intent to, to make it feel as if we're trying to sell ourselves out or, or you know, commercialize ourselves. However, if travelers are still going to don our shores, then I want us to control our story and our narrative. And I want us to do it well. And I want us to do it in, in, a, ver you know, in a variety of ways. Um, so that would be my, my, also my ask, my call to action to whoever who has influence or resource. Let's, let's dig into that a little bit more. Awesome. Lila, do you have any thoughts about um, getting, you know, the right type of tourist it's a very fairly difficult thing to do it's not something you can screen at your screen like in the airport before they arrive if they're going to be respectful or not you know um and it, it, and ultimately like i'll challenge all of us like is it okay for us to do that like is it should should only certain people be given the chance to come to hawaii and experience what hawaii is um, and, and I, you know, it's a, it's a difficult question because, uh, we're challenged with it in Rapa Nui, but our tourism industry, um, it, it sort of ran out of control and we just had to adapt to what was happening. Um, now, at least with this pandemic pause a little bit, we're trying to rethink of that, that question, but Lala, what, do you have any thoughts on that? Really good questions. Um, you know, the idea of like, who should have access to this place, right? And that my work is involved within this concept of equity, right? And the difference is it's, equity is really looking at fairness versus sameness. And if we're gonna continue to move in the space of understanding where we are at as a human species on this island earth, and the real stark realities that we are all collectively um, experiencing right now with a pandemic, um, with the uprising of a social justice movement and the unveiling and the cracks and fault lines within our institutions. Um, I think we need to get really clear on that and be brave in these times to, to push our individual selves, um, as well as our institutions that um, are meant to be stewards of our resources. 
um, and hold a higher expectation, right? And so the idea of like, oh, anybody should be able to come here. That's our, that's our, that's our right. It's our constitutional right. And that's what our challenge is right now as being positioned as a state within the United States is that us as an island, like if we, for example, were operating as a sovereign nation, we would be able to have done things differently to the point where potentially we could have taken best practices from Aotearoa, New Zealand, for example. But because we are tied up in these political relationships of um, not being able to stop um, individuals from coming here, at least not from the continental US, but you know, countries around the world are closing their borders to the US right now. And it's not because it's prejudice or racism, it's for the safety of the people in place. And that's what really needs to be pushed and prioritized, not just within this pandemic, but within our economy. Like what is, again, the indicators and well-being being of people in place. And being able to start to practice that and hold that type of principle and value within our industry is critical. And so, yeah, not everyone can come here because these are the values in which we are holding ourselves as well as what our expectations are as a visitor, right? And so if you can come and practice that with us, my kai, hell am I. But if not, then, you know, this isn't the place for you. And I don't think we should be fearful of that, of like being more distinguished of who and what we are and who and what we want to interact with. You know, around the world, Hawaii is, I think, you know, one of the top three brands in the world. You got Coca-Cola, Disney, and Hawaii. The, the thousands of miles I've had the privilege to travel and the hundreds of places I've been able to go to, I don't think there's ever been one place where when I said, when they asked me, where am I from? And I said, Hawaii, the face. Immediately, it was an opening into a relationship. There wasn't this... Um, say, strangeness to, or there was more of an intrigue. And it was because of what Hawaii is represented and branded is. And, and at its core, what it still embodies, um, that we, we should be more distinguished and more protective of our place. And I, I don't think that's looking at stopping economy. It's shifting it to a new form that holds us um, with higher capacity and capability. And you know, our, our office right now, um, has been the office of climate change has been supporting a lot of the um response and relief efforts around COVID over the past three more four months working with the office of emergency management now we're working and supporting the um, starting up and opening of the office of economic resiliency and you know looking at from the office of climate change and what are our social cultural ecological um, values and abilities and saying Let's move in that space. You know, um, H HGG Hawaii Green Growth, who is kind of our state's platform for our climate change initiatives, um, has adopted the SDGs. HTA is adopting the UN SDGs. Here's our new forms of metrics that we can align with globally, because this is going to take a collective effort to really shift what we're doing on these very macro and micro scales. So how can we be in better relationship with that? Um, and I. In working with that specific, one of those pillars within the new office of economic revitalization is looking at regenerative tourism from an island of Oahu space. Um, and I'm really excited to hear about HTA's efforts around actually creating a county per county um, destination management action plan so that the counties are gonna be able to create, co-create with community on a diverse realm of expertise, everything from practitioners um, in fish ponds to, you know, financial execs to be able to come around a table, scientists from the climate change era um, areas, to be able to come around a table and say, how do we want to co-create and design what our visitor industry should look like right now? And I'm really excited about being able to practice that. It's the first time, I think, in the history of our tourism industry, we're actually doing this. So it's really exciting that there is there are movements in so many different levels from the macro to the micro and the examples of place-based indigenous enterprises and professional practitioners that have been practicing and, and learn and, and figuring out how to participate 
and take agency back of their visitor industry has been really exciting working with Mahina and, and so many others. When we're looking for examples of what does regenerative tourism look like, we don't have to look far at all. It's in our backyards, um, but we have to be very mindful and conscious of how we approach um, in building that in. But it's it really is, there's a ton of opportunities and I can give examples of that, um, but wanna make sure I leave room for my people as yeah. well. No, this is really great. And we're getting a lot of uh, questions and you know, several of them really have to do with like, is there an entity, is HTA able to mandate some of this stuff happening? Do, uh, are, is, is, there, is there a voice uh, there that, you know, there's, there's a comment here about uh, uh, dancing hula at, at, a, at, at a hotel. If the hotel wants a particular type of entertainment, which is not in line with what what you folks are talking about, um, there, there's currently nothing to force them to do what they want, right? Or, or in, in in the same sort of sentiment, maybe when it comes to um, the 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 CO two tax, the carbon tax. Um, forcing passengers to pay for their carbon footprint before they come or uh, forcing airlines to adopt a way to, to allow for that to happen. Um, how, do we, how do we get more people on board? So the first thing I'll say is the Hawaii Tourism Authority is the authority with none. Um, and I found that our actual strategy that's been the most successful and an honest conversation and an actual invitation. And when we invite people to join us in our vision, I've had much greater success um, at really transformative action. Um, things like the carbon tax, right? Certainly we can make policy recommendations to the legislature who have that authority to make those decisions. But I think what we also do is we also play a role in amplifying work that's being done in communities. So one of the programs we funded, I think it was two years ago now, in an area called Kahikinui was getting the forest re uh, reforestation work that was being done there certified so that we could start to sell carbon credits to offset the impacts of tourism. And so um, I think we find more success in areas like that where we can amplify the good work that people are doing and then making really uh, good suggestions to the legislature that are informed and backed up by data and research so that they can take the action because that's the, ultimately that's their responsibility. Lala Mahina, any thoughts about um, getting uh, private entities, private companies on board uh, who, who may, you know, not be in the, in the same mindset? Would you follow the, the same as, as HCA? Uh, so two things. One it well, three things. One is we have two state languages in Hawaii. So I think one of the things that we need to do, at, we need to get a grip. <laughs> we need to recognize that we have two state languages and we need to, if we really wanna be serious about uh, inviting and attracting Pona travelers, then we need to invest in ourselves, which means we need to put more dollars into learning Ola Hawaii the language, the native language of this land. And what that's gonna do, it's like the key. It's like the key to this treasure, treasures, um, you know, where, where we can all learn um, how to more responsibly care for one another and care for this Aina. Um, and just be better citizens of the world, to be quite honest. And then second, you know, again, I'm, I am gonna um, encourage folks to take a look at Aina Aloha Economic Futures because, you know, um, and some other really great uh, plans that are out there called Uplift Hawaii, there's been, it's been really um, encouraging to see so many different uh, grassroots movements, movements come up. And, and so let's all take a look at that um, because we have options and we can all participate in all of them. And then lastly, actually, I want to throw it back to Kalani because I want to learn more about the, the green passport. Is that correct? Yes. Can you tell us more about that, please? Yeah, so ultimately it's a, a fee that would be assessed per traveler to Hawaii that would be set aside for actual reinvestment in conservation and natural resource work. Um, I think where it starts is it's a fundamental understanding that 
if we don't have aina, we have nothing, right? And so as we we continue to sort of understand what the impacts of tourism are, and we're trying to find that right number, and we start arguing over the capacity number and how many and caps, we start getting to the legal barriers where we can't legally in our current situation uh, limit or cap the number of travelers, especially from the US mainland or continent um, because of interstate commerce laws and other things. And so what we then can do, what's completely within our power is to understand how do we invest in what brought them here in the first place. If you ask a traveler, what are the top three things that brought them to the Hawaiian Islands? The first is natural beauty. The second is pristine beaches. And the third is unique culture. And so if we don't protect those things vigorously, then we have nothing in every way that you can measure that. We have nothing to feed us, right? Because Aina is that which feeds us. And if we don't have that, then we're gone. And then fundamentally, the industry would fail to exist because the thing that brought people here no longer exists. So the green fee is a means by which to generate revenue from visitors then to go ahead and reinvest in what brought them here in the first place. Right on, thank you. Laura, go ahead. Yeah, um, I wanna read off, like one of the things that I've been learning within my role right now is it's been, it's been, inc it's incredible, to, it's been incredible to witness um, in, in the small little perch that I'm in, what's happened in the past three or four months here. Um, and it's profoundly challenging as well as inspiring and hopeful. Um, because of my work with inequity and social justice and really my kuleana is to um, provide space, um, create space with you know, my, my, my role within government for agency advocacy and access for our community members, especially those that um, have been disenfranchised, right? Um, and what, how does the visitor industry interface with that, right? Um, and, and working with my leadership and, you know, me throwing out these incredible values and principles and the amount of work that's being done into getting the understanding of what the frame is, what is our compass of values that we can move forward with collectively, which um, I know Aloha Futures, Uplift, Hawaii are just beautiful creations. The, the COVID-19 feminist economic recovery, like powerful stuff coming out that is naming, nourishing, and illuminating both the challenges and adversity as well as the opportunity for solutions, right? And it really is coming back to place and community. And so what I did one night um, or over maybe a week was sit down and say, when I was challenged with the idea of like, okay, give me, I need examples of what are these values saying? Like, what is, what are shovel ready projects? That's what our government is looking for, for solutions. Their understanding is like, okay, great. There's these CARES funding coming down, millions, billions of dollars. Now, where do we put it? And if you want to do something different than what we know how to do, I need a tangible example of that. And so when we're talking about diversifying our economy, we're talking about regenerative tourism. Um, when we're talking about Ainoloha economics, what does that mean? And I just want to read off maybe five to 10 real life examples of what is possible, of what I've, I've been working on over the past couple months. Um, and one of them, of course, giving a shout out to the Ola Resilient Strategy um, within the Office of Climate Change that put this together, um, looking at that as prime examples. Um, you know, there's a million tools and mechanisms around sustainable tourism. Um, hotels, convention centers can be Energy Star certified, right? Um, plastic free Waikiki and zero waste event experiences. We just passed Bill 40. And I know there's talk about, you know, halting that people need to use reusables because of the sanitation. That's questionable as well. Um, I don't think we should stop in going zero waste. And how can our how can Waikiki and our visitor industry be champions of that, right? Of them malaming Aina and saying no more plastic at the Hilton Hawaiian Village. Um, carbon tracker technology apps, get our tech guys, get Purple Maya in here, the young innovators coming up that are creating these incredible softwares that can be used for our visitor industry to track our carbon, be able to, you know, do metrics for their, our visitors to actually participate from our virtual experience. 
um, percentage of rental cars, mandatory EV or hybrid, limit the number of rental cars on island, period. Again, looking at our capacity. Right now, Aloha Stadium is filled with rental cars that are not being used. Um, the idea of how can, you know, when I, with the privilege I've had of traveling around the world, when I go to quote unquote third world countries and look at their tourism industry, I see the representation of the people in place face to face. They own the businesses, they're, they're making the products and selling them to their visit, the visitors. They, they are creating the food. Um, there's much more representation and agency of the root culture in a lot of those places that seemingly third world. Um, so the idea of like, you know, the Kanaka Rangers that came out of Mauna Kea, what if they became stewards of place? And when they're already being able to host spaces and visitor experiences that are looking at uh, archaeology, that are looking at the natural sciences, the living lab, as we call it, right? Um, that's what this place could be. People that want to come, that want to learn about amazing amount of, of resources that can be here. Um, utilizing our hospital, our community colleges and our travel industry management schools to shift to vocational cultural hospitality training or re land resource management. If we need to spend down money and create new jobs, these are ways to do that. Um, the Ina based, um, you know, Ina friendly product services to include literature, crafts, fashion, music, performance art, film, fresh produce, added value products. These are all examples that are already here and they just need more support from an economic standpoint. When the hotels go under, there's gonna be a few properties that are gonna go under in the next couple of years in Waikiki. The city or the state should buy those buildings and create affordable housing, period. That's the first and foremost biggest challenge we have, whether we're talking about climate change, when we talk to our community is affordability. Um, standardized living wage, minimum $15 for anyone in the visitor industry and with benefits instead of these 19 hour work weeks and no benefits, right? Which is what a lot of the tourism industry, people working three or four jobs. Standardized Kama Aina rates for local restaurants, retails, tours and hotels. So Kama Aina can afford and contribute on a regular basis to its visitor industry. Um, you know, Aina programs for hotels. What if hotels adopted um, uh, different I know organizations or innovation spaces that they became stewards for and their their employees got to go out and work and do a volunteer days that's you know talk about regenerative economics. Um, and focusing on wellness and eco travel sectors as Kalani was saying. Um, and then last but not least the geofencing technology to reduce the number of visitors in key areas like we can control that. Um, you know regenerative travel management process and degrees like I mentioned. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's that's one of the 43 that I've counted. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> that's a massive list. And I <laughs> a, thank you for sharing that, because I think, you know, often like it's hard for us to talk up here, but then it's, it's like people walk away and are like, OK, but what does that mean? Like, what can we do? Right. So there is a massive list of possible what can 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 Hawaii do? There's a, there's also this really interesting question that came up about like what are other good examples of other places uh that 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 hawaii can borrow from can implement and i just wanted to share with the four of you and then you know everybody else is watching that like selfishly the reason why i wanted to have this discussion is because rapanu looks at hawaii for leadership i there are a lot of communities look at hawaii and hawaii's tourism for leadership um for for examples that they can copy uh, and 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 I I wouldn't be surprised if it's not only island communities that are doing that, but also uh, communities on the continent or in or in Europe that are going like, oh hey, let's borrow that from Hawaii. It seemed to work for them. So um, this this has been an awesome conversation. We only have uh, ten minutes left to solve the all the other problems in the world, but you know I wanted to like le le leave us off with kind of a, a, a sentiment of like we're all living in very difficult times right now, right? Um, it's, it's, it, it's awesome to be able to think about the future, to think about that light at the end of the tunnel um, and, and, and what that could be. Um, but the reality is that the, the, uh, you know, many people are suffering, are sick, uh, stressed, uh, it, uh, economic issues at home. Right, so I I I, I want to be sensitive to that in in this conversation too, 
that we are dreaming. We are dreaming about the future and we are all dreaming for a, a brighter tomorrow. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious what, what all you guys have in terms of like, what, what is your ideal one sentence of the, the future of, of Hawaii? What does that look like for you in, in one sentence or in two sentences? very long sentences, but <laughs> Kalani Mahina? I'll try. Um, I don't know if I can do the two sentence thing. Um, <laughs> tourism has to be a catalyst for the future that we want to see. It's going to help us meet the immediate needs that people have that are suffering, right? Like where is their next meal coming from? And then I think beyond that, the, the other half of that is, um, why do we do it and who does it benefit? And we got to answer that question for whatever future we want to see um, in Hawaii. Um, yeah. Um, so I'll try in two sentences. The first sentence uh, just kind of describes my pain, my, my own personal suffering with this, uh, which is someone else's liberties should not impede on my own ability to live resiliently. And then um, my, my hope um, and my affirmation is that I am because of Aina. I am and we are because of Aina. Um, yeah, I don't know if I can do you can do a one, one sentence, but I'll try. Um, I think it's looking at when the prosperity of a community is synonymous with the health of all of its parts and relationships. Um, and the visitor industry can reflect that. That would be the ideal. Um, and to honor and acknowledge with this transition, we need to be clear that we're bringing everyone along with us and that those that are in these spaces of privilege and power have a kuliana to do that. It's to bring us together in all of this. And if we're not doing that, we need to stop and adjust. Um, yeah, mahalo. I did it again. Uh, thank you so much, you guys, for, for being on this panel. What an what, uh, incredible conversation. I wish we had another hour. Maybe we'll have another opportunity, and we can bring a lot more of those people in power to have that conversation and, and invite them in to be part of this process. Um, I want to really thank the Honolulu Museum of Art for pulling us together and getting us together. Uh, Pacific Islanders and Communications, Office of Climate Change, Sustainability and Resiliency, Waiwai Collective, John Leong, Plastic Oceans, and Cartumquin Films. Like we have a lot of supporters and partners that have been uh, helping us to, to get you folks together. Um, this uh, panel will live on in perpetuity in the internet. So I hope more discussion comes out of this. I, I, and, and I hope we're able to build on this and we can learn from you know, what we're talking about today in a month, in a year from now, and we can see, you know, what really gave fruit or not. Um, I also want to remind everybody that there'll be a, a survey at the end um, of this uh, panel. It's very important for us uh, to really just understand what you've gotten out of it um, and, and how we can improve it. Um, and with that, um, I wanted to uh, pass it off to Kalani and Mahina for to close out our panel. Sure. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, we'd like to close today with something uh, that I think is very um, innate to us here in Hawaii. Um, and it's this idea of duality and, and beginnings and, and lights and darks. It's all this um, interconnectedness. And so like anything else, um, whether it be uh, time, whether it be space, all of these things have relations. And then we also have beginnings and ends. And so as we begin to wrap up uh, today's session, um, Mahina is going to offer an oli for us um, that really asks for long life. 
uh, and that we might thrive and that we might um, like a lay uh, be woven together and that like any lay you make, um, it has a beginning and an end and an opening and a close. And so I'll go ahead and turn it over um, to Mahina. And on behalf of my, uh, my ohana, my dear friends, uh, we wanna thank the filmmaker. We wanna thank you, Sergio Mata'u and, and your, your lovely wife for producing this absolutely stunning film that is really you know, causes us to pause. And I think any anytime an artist does that, um, you've been manaful. So thank you very much for the six years of, of hard work. <laughs> and this is for all of, all of us, uh, all of your ohana and all of your aina that you currently reside and, and from which you um, originate. I offer this to you. And at the end, it's very short. At the end, I'm gonna say, ah mama, with a pause and then everyone can clap twice. Then uanoa, then twice again. And what you're doing is we are signaling that we affirm, we have heard this intention that we will all be well, that we will live abundantly, that we will heal, that we will transform and, um, and we will do so with great intention and with aloha. O kau o la e ke aku a e na na mai kau mau pula pula e o la kaniko o a hau makai o le a palalau hala a kau i kapu a ne a ne. Alai la la ve atu o ya ui ke aloa ke ae. Ah, mama. Ua noa. Mahalo. Aloha. Mahalo. Aloha. Aloha.